So thanks for being part of this, and uh, we'd like to give you an opportunity to ask a question. You might have had one. Yep. We're big on citations and source material, and I wonder is there also with your classical conversation, uh, classical education mindset, do you have a source with the Lieber case and all of that kind of coming of events in classical education, a good source that we can give to other people that have good citations within that and pass off for them? Like you said, the right trail, go do that knowledge. Yeah, you know, I wish I could say yes, go here. I, you know, you know, the citations that I have are, it's just stuff I'm reading. Um, when I preach, by the way, this is something I, I, I often do, is if I've got a quote that I want to make, this last Sunday I quoted Francis Schaeffer, John R. W. Stott, Thomas Chalmers, uh, and B.B. Um, Warfield, and um, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And instead of having all the quotes on a little note card or whatever, I bring the books into the pulpit. Mm. I have a bookmark in there. I open it up, and I read it from the text mm. itself. Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I am a dinosaur. I like the that. reason I do that... It would be a lot easier if I just, you know, cut and pasted from Google Books, you know, the quote that I wanted. But I want my people to see real books. Yeah. And I want them to be able, you know, oftentimes after the service, people come up to the pulpit and they grab the books and they go, where, where did you get that? <laughs> and uh, they want to read it themselves. I missed part of that quote. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a simple pedagogy uh, but it is, it's a really powerful one. So I, I didn't answer your question, but uh, other than to say, I, my citations, I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm not like these guys. I'm, I'm just a preacher, but I, uh, but I just read a lot and use what I'm reading, whatever I'm reading. So this, this prompts a question for me. Uh, the pulpit that you use, tell us about it. So. Most pulpits these days are not actually crafted to do what you just described. Yeah, I have an antique pulpit. Uh, my I pulpit. figured that. Either, either you designed it or it was really old. No, I didn't design it. I have the pulpit of E.M. Bounds. Oh, wow, wow. You stole it. <laughs> now, where, where, where did you get it? I mean, it was like on an auction? E.M. You know, e. Bounds, uh, you, can, you can get it? You know, no, mailed to your house today? Or? No, there was somebody. I, I live in a town that E.M. Bounds, uh, <laughs> he was a chaplain uh, in the Battle of Franklin. Uh, I live in Franklin, Tennessee. He was a chaplain in the Battle of Franklin. And uh, he left, he was from Missouri, w left and went and visited every family of boys from Missouri that were killed in the battle. Wow. Uh, but then came back to Franklin and became the pastor of the Methodist Church. And eventually was run out of the Methodist Church on a rail, wound up in Georgia, and started writing uh, books on prayer, uh, extraordinary books yeah, on right, prayer. Right. Uh, but somebody took his old pulpit and put it in a warehouse somewhere, hmm. and it sat in a warehouse for 100 years. Wow. And when we planted our church, I started doing these little walking tours of downtown, uh, telling the spiritual story of Franklin, hmm. largely highlighted with the story of E.M. Bounds. Somebody heard I was doing this and said, by the way, I happen to have E.M. Bounds's pulpit <laughs> in my barn. <laughs> And he gave great. it to us. Pretty great. He gave it Other to questions? Us. Yes. Got, and then got some guys in the back. Right. Quick, quick. Got. So I love what you said about uh, God has chosen us for this time and the great blessing of being in this time. This conversation I had with my parents who grew up in a very different time and now are looking at the age of their grandchildren are coming up in. And they're kind of lamenting like, oh, I'm so sad. I feel so bad for the world our grandkids are, are going to be adults in. And I said, well, actually, I think I'm excited that we're raising kids that are going to be prepared to fight those battles. And I use the analogy of they, they're, they're, these kids are going to be dragon slayers, and so they need dragons to slay. It's going to be really obvious what they are. 
My question for you, so as we do that, my kids are 14 down to age seven. I got four kids and they're, we're homeschooling them and classically and all of that, but at some point this idea that they're gonna go out and start to kill dragons, how do you make that transition from being sort of prepared to do that versus doing that, because you do that too early and they just get eaten by a dragon and they're done, or you delay it too long and now they're never doing anything, they're just you know playing video games and or reading books in mom's basement, right? So what, how do you think about that and what advice do you have yeah, give them uh, juvenile lizards along the way to slay. <laughs> I mean, as a family, you should be involved in your community. Um, volunteer at the local, um, you know, food bank, or uh, volunteer at the local crisis pregnancy center. Uh, be be involved. Let them be exposed to th those kinds of things. Do missions trips. Uh, get them involved in the, the wider community. Uh, and uh, so it becomes just a normal part of their life uh, where they're not responsible to be the one guy who goes with a lance against the dragon. They're part of this uh, lifestyle community where... Uh, there is both resistance to the world and the glory of flourishing reformation all taking place at the same time. So a couple of hands in the back. So Chris, why don't we go with you because we didn't get your question last time and then we'll... Yeah. Um, so uh, Pastor George, you talked about joy and gladness. You talked about chalmers and whistling. And what do you I was really curious in terms of like even the brother's point about slaying dragons, how important is it for us to recover beauty and a sense of imagination? It seems like that's what was in the air. And, and how, yeah, maybe you can kind of expound a little bit about that if you think that it is a necessary part of this thing. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I love about Celtic Christianity is that uh, they they uh, put a premium on what they called the warrior poet. Mm. So they, they understood that life is hard and that there are battles to be fought and uh, there's uh, all, all of this difficulty that must be uh, confronted and undertaken. But, the, but they also understood the importance of song, imagination, poetry, beauty, and uh, they filled their lives with it. And I, I think creating that balance is really important. I oftentimes use the analogy of uh, the longbow. The longbow was this incredible uh, technological development that helped, uh, for instance, Henry V win the Great Battle of Agincourt. Uh, the thing about a longbow is, is that uh, it... It needed to be tended. If you leave the longbow strung all the time, it loses its elasticity. So one of the things that you have to do is you have to unstring the bow, oil it, put it in its leather sheath, and set it somewhere in the house cool away from the fire so that it can, in a sense, recover the elasticity. I think human beings are longbows. We have to unstring the bow. Uh, we have to learn how to rest and recover uh, in order to be ready when the battle comes. The truth is, is that you don't, if the dragon slayers don't slay dragons every single day. Hmm. Dragon slayers uh, slay dragons maybe twice in a lifetime. Uh, so you have to be ready for that. <clears throat> But you also have to have a life. And this is one of the things that I, I, I have great hope in Christian civilization in our day because we have lives. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so many of the radicals <laughs> don't have lives. That, all they've got is their radicalism. Yeah, yeah. All, all they've got is pulling down their top uh, uh, on the White House lawn. Mm, that's their, is what we yeah. had this yeah. last week. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. w we've got lives. We've got children. We've got um, husbands and wives and uh, hobbies and joys and and uh, we're interested in things and we listen to different kinds of music and it's it's rich. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yep. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, 
many of us uh, are pastors or elders and here for the PCA's General Assembly, and uh, if we're doing our job well, we're, we have an eye to where our denomination might go in the future. So we're you know, thinking through the overtures, we're contending for the faith. Uh, and you spoke about Chalmers as a pastor doing the same things. I think you alluded briefly to some of the problems that he was contending for. Uh, you mentioned government intrusion and uh, liberalism. I, I don't know if the problem has really changed that much. But, um, <laughs> but just, just elaborate a little bit. What, how would he as a pastor contended for the uh, one of the things that Chalmers did was he was never rash. <clears throat> he was very deliberate and intentional and strategic. Um, and if you know anything about church history in Scotland, uh, the battle for the Church of Scotland was a 10-year-long battle. Uh, and the, they, they called it the 10 years conflict. And when... Uh, so, so Chalmers was was planting churches for 10 years. He was, he was raising up students for 10 years uh, while the conflict was brewing. When it got to the place where it was not only not possible to continue the fight without compromising the integrity of local churches, it was only then that he decided that it was time to walk away from the national church. Um, so one of the things that I would say is we're, <clears throat> we are in a time in our culture where we can expect that we will have the intrusion of worldly ideas into our denomination, in, into the PCA. We can expect that. We need to be prepared for that. The way we get prepared for that is that we disciple our families in our local churches very well. We keep them apprised of where the battle lines are. We do it graciously. As Harry Reader uh, so beautifully and powerfully often said, we need to say what we mean and mean what we say, but never say it meanly. And when we go into uh, battle, we, we may one day come to the place where we say, as we did 50 years ago, oh my, this is, there's, there's no way forward, um, but the gospel must prevail, so let's start afresh. I don't think we're anywhere near that. In fact, I don't know about you, but I've been supremely encouraged in this General Assembly. I remember going to St. Louis and thinking to myself, okay, this is Waterloo, and it wasn't Waterloo. And then uh, to go into Birmingham and thinking, well, it may not be Waterloo, but it might be Agincourt, and it wasn't <laughs> Agincourt. And here we are, in Memphis, and God is doing marvelous things. Yeah, yeah, I've been encouraged. I know a number of people I've talked to feel the same way. Other thoughts or and questions? And Fred Greco is a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned Neil Postman, which is always very fun for me. Uh, I read this book, Technopoly, probably 25 years ago now. Uh, just, you know, he talks about in, in that how technology is kind of embedded with the kind of world views and ways and changes the way that we think about, about the world because of their technology. I, I wonder, uh, is, is there anybody doing work these days about how smartphones are changed? I think most of the past before the age of the smartphone, he, he did a lot of work on on screens, on television versus print, uh, which I think is still important for us to consider because this print really shaped the process of reformation, for one thing. But uh, is, is there anybody who we work on smartphones? And I think we, we kind of see it in, in the, on the podcast, you guys do a lot of good uh, talking about it. I think there's, in terms of that analysis, is that just one doing that, or do you know about one doing that? Yeah, there, there are people that are working uh, in the front lines on everything from uh, AI to the ubiquitous use of smartphones and what that means for the way we learn. Uh, you know, 
uh, gone are the days of library catalog cards mm. uh, and uh, the, the the process of researching has mm. been radically transformed uh, if you let it uh, be transformed. It, it is possible to do research the old-fashioned way. Um, and, and there are some people that are doing research uh, on those areas. I think we're really yeah. early on because I think we're really just now catching on uh, to the the enormity of the problem and the way that it's reshaping. Some of the best uh, new research that I have seen uh, in the area of uh, the intersection of the human mind and soul uh, with uh, technology is research on pornography hmm. and the way that pornography reshapes the way that the brain actually functions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a... That, that's kind of the leading edge of the best of the research on, on that. Yeah, a resource that I have appreciated for years is Ken Myers at uh, Marcel Audio. The uh, Marcel Audio uh, Journal gets into that sort of thing a lot. Doug, do you have anybody that comes to mind that maybe you could name? Yeah, a lot. Um, <laughs> there's a guy named Andy Crouch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a book called The Life We're Looking For. I just finished it. Reclaiming relationship in the technological world. He's, he's solid. He has good insights into technology. Um, I wrote a book many years ago. It's one of those books you only see in, in the yard sales anymore. <laughs> called The Soul in Cyberspace. Mm, that's a great book. 1997. I think five people read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George did. <laughs> Me and his mom, you know. We... <laughs> yeah, but Andy also has a book out called The Tech Wise Family, which is about setting up wise patterns in your home, not being dominated by screens. So I, I think his work is good. Uh, there's another guy named Alan Noble. Yeah, I've heard of Alan. What's his book? I can't think he's written two books. Uh, he's done some good work in philosophy and technology. D Doug Scott um, has. Um, a new book on artificial intelligence published by InterVarsity. I've only seen a chapter of it. I was sent a preview chapter, uh, but it's just out, and it's supposed to be um, it, it, it's supposed to be really good. The, the chapter that I read portended that it was going to be really good. Great. One thing I'd, I'd want to throw in here, and this is just sort of one of my ideas on this. Um, in a single phrase, Google makes you stupid. And I mean that quite literally, because in order to learn something, you have to associate it with something you already know. Mm -hmm. What Google enables you to do is not know anything. So you create fewer, because you can you pull out your phone, you can look it up right away. You, know, you don't have to have it in your mind. So you have fewer hooks in your mind, therefore it is harder to learn new things. Yeah. There are fewer associations that you can make. And, of course, everything from Wikipedia and, and, and Google across the board, it's all been weaponized. Right, right. And so it's, it, it really is unhelpful. Yeah. It presents itself as neutral, but mm -hmm. it's been vetted by people who have an agenda. Uh, yeah. It sounds like Chalmers' uh, Keystone passage has kind of disappeared with him. Uh, has anyone tried to recreate the Keystone passages in the New Testament? Uh, yes. He never wrote it down in one place. Hannah recorded part of it. He, he adjusted it and developed it over time. You have to go to all of his students to pick up little threads of it. Um, but uh, I've produced... Uh, three volumes of New Testament Lexio Divina journals mm -hmm. that have the keystone verses, that give an introduction to Chalmers and the method, how to use it in your family, how to use it in a school, how to use it in homeschooling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, it's called uh, Keystones Make Disciples. It is now currently in print. Uh, we're, ch we're changing. It, it's, uh, they're mo moleskin-like uh, hardback journals right now. I'm changing the format 
Um, it, we're, we're in the process of producing them now where you can fit them into, a, into an A5 journal. Uh, so uh, you can get it in either, either format. Great. Anything else? I think I saw maybe one or more people. I guess not. Well, thanks, George. It's been great. And uh, if you don't have to run, if, you know, we've got this room until 7. Uh, so if you want to hang out and uh, maybe enjoy some more food, some more beer, whatever, beer. just hang out with us, that would be great. All right. Thanks for coming. It's been Thank a lot of fun. Much.